cool. So Shane, we've been working together for a, a while now, in spite of having known each other for many years. It's the first time that we've really worked together. And uh, things are getting really exciting with, with the Gluka proposition and our view to really innovate for inclusive exponential growth. So we've kind of brought together um, the Exo Futures Group capability um, for you know, innovation at scale, I guess, transformation at scale, digital inclusion, and your marketplace maker model. Do you want to talk to that a bit? Yeah, Craig, I think it is exciting times. And I think the hard work over the last couple of years is definitely starting to, to come together. A marketplace maker, just very simply to everybody, is, is the adaptation of business transformation using technology methods and tools applied to the ecosystem and specifically geared at an outside in innovation approach that says how do we make sure we include the little guys how do we make sure that all the small micro informal sector participants are able to participate in the economy and we've put a lot of work into a model and a method and a framework that allows us to be able to achieve that um, which again is quite exciting because it aligns with where the global economy is going and this whole digital mm. economy. Yeah. And it kind of led to your introduction to me of the NFDR. Maybe touch on that briefly. Yeah. Um, one of the most critical things to be able to include the, the typically underserved markets is, is access to them in a meaningful way. And one of the, um, the engagements with NFDI that, that we're excited about is the fact that they represent a group of foundations, but also importantly have partnerships with the faith and civil society organizations. Um, so you can imagine there's at least one or two or several churches in every single community. Um, so the ability to leverage civil society to engage the underserved market um, on their terms and on the ground where they are. That's what that relationship um, symbolizes for us. And, and again, yeah. a very important part of our strategy. Yeah, and that relationship has also led to um, structuring a black economic empowerment uh, deal. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a strategic structure really that empowers the EXO group and our capability to, to execute on this. So it's, it really is getting very compelling and exciting. Now, let, so let me just briefly introduce myself and, and then you can do the same. So from, you know, from my side, I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I'm not gonna read all of this. Um, started and, and pivoted through a number of, of, of entities and they're represented by the, 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 the various XO entities uh, here. But really with a with strong background in financial services, and technology, but business first. So, you know, solving business problems and, um, you know, the challenges of digitizing and transforming businesses at scale, but, but also for exponential growth. Um, and, th and that's led to us partnering on this Kluka Innovation Factory between the group and, and Marketplace Maker. So over to you, Shane. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why we working together craig is you know we both have a passion for entrepreneurship we both have a passion for innovation we're both very purpose-driven and oriented in what we do so yeah on my side leveraging the 30 years experience um, we have purposefully gone about working with township economies startups small medium enterprises large corporates and multinationals, including my, my, my years in IBM. And I always say IBM is the best university um, in the world that, that I was fortunate to, to get exposed to. Um, so yeah, it's really about how do we leverage all of that capability to solve massive um, transformation problems, which is what the world needs and what Africa needs. Um, yeah. and, and that's what we bring to bear. Yeah, so, so really to create the digital and financial inclusion that 
scales economic mobility, you know, from, from the ground up. Um, because we know that, you know, our past has been contrary to that. It's really disenfranchised everybody, many, many people, uh, and really empowered only a few. And we also know that if the events of last July are, are left to just, you know, fade from memory and we don't do something really impactful, we're in trouble. So, you know, we really are trying to create a movement that is purposeful about changing the lack of digital and economic inclusion that exists and, and really using ecosystem transformation as a, as a, as a way to, to leapfrog, you know, the, the, all of the, the problems that we've had up to now. Now, and if I can add to that, the, <clears throat> the most recent uh, reports on the employment and unemployment situation, effectively South Africa's got about 40 million people in the labor, labor pool um, from age 15 to 65 out of a population of 60. If you look at the formal, we have just over 14.3 14, 14 million people employed. Less than 10 million of those are in the formal sector. The rest of them are informal. So we literally 25% of our, of our labor working age population are, are employed in the formal sector. Um, we then have a, it's actually up to 12 and a half million now in the expanded view, people that are either unemployed or are discouraged from even looking for employment. And then a massive, massive dependency um, with the rest on, on grants from, from the fiscus. So we have, we have a burning platform. We have an imperative. We it's need to accelerate. We need to scale um, solving of these problems. And again, that is what we get up to do every single day. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so we really are trying to create new markets and orchestrate digital and financial inclusion in, in, from the outside in, as you've said. So these de decentralized and distributed underserved markets that will allow for economic inclusion is, is, is the point. And, and we do this through what we call ecosystem transformation for the digital reinvention of Africa's ecosystems that creates inclusive exponential growth. So. Shane, you, you've come up with this model, which uh, is really starting to resonate with a lot of people. You want to take us through it? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Craig. Um, so having spent a lot of time with the large corporates, there's a very well-established market, but in South Africa and Southern Africa, um, there are either monopolies or oligopolies. Um, very linear business models, very constraint oriented in the way they operate. Um, so again, four big banks, four big telcos, four big retails, four big consumer goods companies in South Africa. Um, and, and that follows in just about every, every situation. And then based on the unemployment statistics, you can imagine how big that underserved market is. Um, it's huge. There are a tremendous amount of small medium micro enterprises, a, a huge informal sector, which the large corporates are starting to wake up to um, and get excited. But you can imagine, obviously, the big corporates are able to afford the lawyers and the accountants and the technologists and, and the expertise that they can use to transform and digitize themselves. But if we want to be able to bring the underserved markets as well as create that market for, for um, shared wealth, then what we focused on is how do we get inclusive transformation between the large established and the underserved? There's a lot of big corporates and consulting companies serving the established markets. There's a lot of CSI you know, foundations serving the underserved markets, but there's not a lot of um, focus on bringing that together. So that's what this framework's all about is how do we drive inclusive shared markets and really get to that cyber physical real economy enabled by digital economy the virtual world um, of the future that is truly shared the way we go about doing that is um, looking at catalyzing and assisting in catalyzing initiatives that are purpose in in, in and intent the intent is around purpose which is profit and purpose specifically um, looking for inclusion 
and large-scale projects. And then from that, facilitate the seed to scale of those, of those initiatives into a virtual integrated economy. If you just think about cooperatives, they by default are shared economies. If you think about digitizing those cooperatives, then um, that's effectively what, what we're looking at. So we've put a lot of work into catalyzing some of our own initiatives um, as proof points and where we see um, obvious opportunity, but we've also engaged with, with other, quite a few other people. And we actually now have arguably more, more initiatives than, than there is ability to, to deal with. And part of what we're looking to do is to standardize and open source, if you will, that ecosystem transformation mechanism and capability so we can we can yeah. scale it up. Just yeah, the and there's two points. That, yeah, two points Sorry. there. I mean, the one the one is that we can't, we definitely can't do it all ourselves. So it's it's really about trying to orchestrate and you know drive a movement that is coming along on the journey with us to to transform. And then importantly, driving that with the right governance and incentives. You know that actually creates the inclusive economy on, on the right so yeah how are we so going to do that <clears throat> so critical to that is there's a there's a shift globally where into impact investment as as almost a new class of of investment that specifically is saying yes we've got our private equity and venture capitalists that are typically purely profit driven on the one hand we've got a lot of our grant foundations and, and others on the other hand, but there's a there's a massive shift towards impact investment that is looking for profit and purpose. And what we're what we're looking to do is to put together effectively using um, tokenization and, and um, de decentralized models, create a virtual impact fund that allows all of those different investors to invest appropriately based on their mandates in a transformation. Um, that, that gives profit and purpose. To do that, what we've spent the last couple of years doing um, is actively going out and engaging globally with a set of ecosystem development partners. And, and we've, from, from legal teams to method, methodologies to monitoring and evaluation to obviously technology, innovation, consulting, we've been looking at building out an ecosystem of global partners that we can bring to bear on these transformation projects. Um, if we're going to be driving the transformation, it becomes critical that we have the value exchanges that allow transparency and the tracking and tracing of the profit and purpose value that has been exchanged and developed and extracted out of, out of the different ecosystems. And to achieve that, what we've um, started working on is what we're calling our economics which is really about the, the tokenomics of this. What's, what's the measure of value? How do we recognize financial capital to traditional shale capital, introduce social capital, make sure that the founders that have put, taken the risk and put the sweat in the equity and, and, and to have the founders capital, how do we incent the development ecosystem through innovation capital? And ultimately, how do we shift towards a stakeholder capital um, where literally all participants share in the value. And it's pretty exciting, eh, Shane, because it's kind of an, an intersection of fintech, you know, legal tech, regulatory tech, and, and the three of those coming together for impact at scale. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited about how this is going to play out. And, you know, we've, to do this, we've leveraged uh, the, the marketplace maker model and the Kluka implementation model into the into the value prop. I'm not sure if you want to talk too much to this piece of the slide. Now, I think we can talk a little bit further, but um, what we've done is on the right hand side, we look at on the top, the established incumbents. Um, in the middle, we look at the decentralized marketplaces with shared insights that, that aggregate and orchestrate multiple different um, collaborators, small, medium, micro ventures and entities. And we also consider the underserved market. So not only how do we optimize existing markets, but how do we expand and grow into underserved markets? So that's what the right is about. The left is about what we call our innovation factory, which is all about um, 
receiving syndicated funding of different types, taking it from uh, through four streams of, of, of activity and work um, for the transformation exercise, the, making sure incentives and governance, the new ventures are developed, SMEs are empowered and, and skills are developed. Um, and obviously benefiting the, the beneficiaries. So those stages, we've, we've put work into what are the high level milestones and stages that, that each of them go to. And I, I don't wanna under, I can't underemphasize the importance of the catalyst phase. Um, you know, we think big, we think about the future, but we're very, very, very focused on saying we have to design for the future that is shared. We, we, we have to know what direction we're going in. We have to know what the principles and design criteria are and the outcomes are from the beginning. And, and that's what the, the catalyst phase is, is all about. And, and that really is the starting point for, for these journeys. Yeah, it's kind of an impact program accelerator that looks at the four layers, you know, governance platforms and ventures, SMEs and skills, and says, what might that future state look like if we bring all of these capabilities together? We digitize at scale, we platform wherever we can, um, you know, and that's really more about business model innovation in those environments than it is about just digitizing. And, um, you know, that we, we, we actually franchise as much as possible so that it's repeatable and scalable. I, you know, I think a large part of what's happening in the, um, in the, in the VC and entrepreneurship space is you're trying to find one hero, you know, and his jockey with an idea that, that you can turn into a unicorn. And our view is that we, we've got to flip that and actually create the businesses and then put the people into them. So that's the notion of, of you know, franchise digitization. And then of course, you know, we have a massive dearth of, of skills and capacity. So, so that's a critical part of the, of the development role. Shane, do you want to add and, anything and to that? Yeah, I think good to remind, remind me, um, we're not doing one at a time. We, we don't have the time to be able to, to do one venture at a time, one startup, one SME at a time. It, it is the imperative that we have on the table right now just does not allow us that, that, that luxury. So everything we've done is about how do we do things at scale? How do we aggregate the innovation transformation activities? Um, also, how do we leverage grants and other impact funding to effectively acquire the equity for future inclusion? So instead of a lot of investments being made with very little measure in financial terms, there's no reason why we can't leverage that impact and grant funding to make a difference on a social or environmental level, but also to leverage that to create future wealth for the underserved market and, and, and the, the small guys that have never been able to participate in, in, in the true value of, of the journeys. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of debate about universal basic in income, but I actually much prefer this notion of universal basic equity, which is kind of what we're driving to. Yeah, cool. So then, it, of course, besides the, the, the catalyzing and, and creating the right governance and incentives for the transformation journey, um, the, there's these three aspects. I don't know if we need to elaborate on these more, Shane. Yeah, I think what the important part of the message here is, is, um, you know, venture capitalists would, and a lot of the accelerators out in the market would focus on venture acceleration. And there's a very specific capability that is important to be able to find those exponential types of businesses that can grow. Then there are other engagements and, and focus areas that are really about the SMEs, which are not necessarily on one by one incremental, but if they are collective, then we can. And then there's a huge cohort of, of uh, service providers focusing on skills development. At the moment, it's all highly fragmented. There's, there's different players in these three areas doing lots of different things. But what we're aiming today, again, um, in our, with our method and approach is to bring those together. And hence, our focus on collaboration and inclusion in the development ecosystem. Let's go and do this together, guys. Um, if we do that and we bring these together into an integrated program, we can actually make a big difference. 
Yeah, we have to orchestrate this at scale. Otherwise, we're never going to catch up with the, the challenge that we that we face. So we, we've, as as you mentioned, we've started to catalyze, and and some of these projects are quite advanced. But here's a sort of overview of what we're doing. Um, the first one is this impact chain for digital and financial inclusion that you know drives towards this notion of universal universal equity. Um, so, so the impact chain provides an SDG based virtual impact fund to manage liquidity, utility and value exchange. So it's, it's the opportunity for funders to select one or more SDGs as the basis of their investment and intent. And on a blockchain, this will then be visible as the funds flow through the development cycle to ultimately demonstrate actual impact outcomes. Shane, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the important part, in addition to that, again, if you think about the method, if we, during catalyst phase, um, make sure that the initiatives are identifying the outcomes that are both profit and purpose. The important part of the impact chain is let's raise funding based on the sustainable development goals, the appropriate ones, but let's also make sure that that funding is directed towards achieving the outcomes and importantly are reporting on those outcomes as, as they are tracked and traced through, through the life cycle. The reason why blockchain um, and distributed ledgers and tokens become so important in the enablement of this is it allows us a real-time tracking and, and monitoring. Um, it allows us immutability. Um, it allows us elements of consensus, which allows the right uh, impact investors and participants to vote on the priorities to ensure that um, the biggest impact and the biggest outcomes can be achieved. Yeah, and and you know I think the reason that it sort of centres around SDG seventeen is the point that you know it, it's not fragmented, it's not siloed. It, it needs to be orchestrated across you know potentially more than one um, SDG at a time. So that's cool. Uh, and then the next project, which is really getting exciting, is, is the Medidi Water Project, where we're democratizing access to water to reduce the inequality that results as a, from not having potable water. So the Medidi, Medidi Water Project provides potable water to underserved communities. Medidi is the first town where we're doing the, 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 the proof of concept, but it is being applied to the whole Macau region where the, the chief actually said, you're not just doing one town, you need to do our region. And, and that's, that's, uh, that, that's been agreed. So water distribution there is enabled with digital access to a cashless solution that creates jobs further serving upliftment. Um, and there's a significant cost reduction in the water supply. And fascinatingly, approximately 60% of the water revenue returns to the community trust for future development and upliftment projects. And the water's free to school. So, you know, th those future projects, the next project that the community would vote on, and the next project could well be food tunnels, you know, it could be the creation of a, a bakery franchise, it could be whatever they feel is necessary. It might just be reinstating the, the distribution of the water to the to the community. So yeah, interesting times. We're actually going to visit Medidi tomorrow. I'm very excited about that. Shane, I don't know if you want to add anything there. Uh, again, the only other um, coming back to tokenization and the tracking and value of, of, of the value of water. So if you think about it, the water is provided by the government, the local municipality, the population, the community that lives there has the right to that water and it needs to flow through a value chain that says, well, how much water comes out of the ground? How much water... Um, then gets cleansed and is made made available for, for distribution to the community. Um, and how do we make sure that we understand the, that the, the equity of that, that everybody's getting their fair share and their rights of, of the clean water? And how do we start to measure and monitor that that is done, done in, a, in, a, in a powerful way? At the moment, nobody knows anything, actually, hard facts as to how much water is coming, how good or bad the water how pure is the water um, and well, how's it getting to the households? 
So a big part of the solution that we're looking to, to innovate around is, is again the tokenization of water across the full life cycle. Yeah, so if you, if you think about the insights, I mean, it, 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 it starts with the fact that the, the water rights actually vest with the community. All we're doing is, is um, purifying the water so that it's potable. Um, but those rights actually result in some equity. And how do you track that, uh, you know, and that, that process through uh, uh, the production of the water, through the use of the water, through the, the, any value add that takes place and, and track that equity as an outcome. Shane Filmsparza, <clears throat> Democratizing Africa Stories, um, your best to talk this one through. Yeah, this, this is actually <clears throat> kind of where a lot of my marketplace maker model got started years and years ago, where I met um, one of the founders of, of Film Spaza in, in Deep Slurt, one of the local townships, um, doing a social responsibility project. And he raised the issue to me of um, he wants to replicate what's happening in Nollywood in, in West Africa. I kind of said, well, what's that about? And did a bit more research, obviously, after the meeting. And really what it was, was creating volumes of local entertainment films um, in Nollywood, arguably not the best quality, and then distributing them immediately through distribution channels. And most fascinating out of all of that, being the second employer, of, uh, second biggest employer of people in the country, in Nigeria specifically. So that kind of piqued the interest and that's um, resulted in how do we build an integrated ecosystem of participants that allows us as African citizens to tell our own stories, but not only just tell our own stories, also own the equity associated in the creation and distribution of our own stories, whilst serving an audience that today struggles to afford access to quality entertainment. So yeah, uh, Film Spars is all about democracy, democratizing Africa stories as Craig introduced. Um, and it's all about collaboration um, in both being able to craft and create different narr narratives, um, create the characters, uh, curate and manage the quality stories. And we say quality, we're looking at proper quality stories that allows brands and brand value and brand development from the established markets to be developed into the communities and to serve them. Um, we've done a lot of work um, where we are now, um, again, with the imperative of creating jobs in mind. Um, we've created a three-year roadmap that allows us to be able to create 244 special purpose vehicles for new films um, that will create uh, order of magnitude, 4,800 new small, medium micro enterprises, and will create over 17,000 full-time equivalent quality jobs. We're not saying they're all brand new people. We're leveraging people that are working in the economy as well as bringing new, new skills to the table, new capacity. But what we are focused on is making sure that they are sustainable, full-time equivalent, decent jobs. In addition to that, we've, we've modeled out how do they have equity in this future um, uh, cooperative, digital cooperative that everybody participants, participates in, and, and what's the shared value and the shared, shared revenues of that. So by applying the model to digitize and orchestrate and you know, increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the flow of the, of the production of film, um, we believe we can make this sustainable. And, and I really like the simple notion that you could invest in an SDG 8, so decent work and economic growth impact token of 30,000 Rand, and that would create the sustainable job. And we'll demonstrate the, the journey as to that sustainable job on the blockchain and make it visible and transparent and, and, and you know, uh, show how that scales over time. And anything and else there, Shane? Yeah. 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 So we, we've kind of got two scenarios. We've got the one scenario that says in South Africa as the real proof, 
how do we get to maximum jobs that are fully sustainable as quickly as possible? That's the 17,000 at 30,000 Rand or $2,000 full-time job that'll create profit and purpose. We've also got a much smaller scaled down version that says, well, the minimal viable ecosystem that would allow sustainability of the SMEs and the jobs is 12 films a year. Um, if we had to do that over three years, it would cost us closer to about 70,000 Rand per job because there's obviously some infrastructure and common components that we would need to amortize across, across the ecosystem. <coughs> so we can think big, start small. We can start with the smaller ends in mind, but again, through aggregation and in, for the intent of scale, um, we have the ability to be able to dramatically reduce the total cost of creating net new jobs. Um, and it really comes down to what's the appetite of investors and impact investors to take risk to accelerate transformation and inclusion. And I think starting small is important, but maybe we should just mention that you've actually done a prototype and, you know, created the first film and, you know, validated the numbers and the costs and the process and all that kind of thing. So we're not basing this all on assumptions. We've got our own data in the market to, to, to come to these numbers. So it's exciting, exciting times, especially for film spaza. Right, moving on. So the Medique supply chain localization project uh, is is in the tourism industry, and 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 we've said in the film industry that that's probably the biggest multi job multiplier. But actually, tourism is also a massive job multiplier for financial inclusion. So this one is localizing and digitizing the supply chain, creating a thousand jobs in fifty six new businesses, and substantially reducing supply costs for the lodges. Um, there's an element of carbon credit and uh, land regeneration. There's definitely lower poaching levels as you get the community more um, more empowered in, in through the process. Um, obviously, the community reserve relationships improve, and there's a massive upliftment dividend as the lodges actually yield higher occupancies through um, the empowerment and localization and you know, universal the notion of universal equity for the for the community. So imagine if every time you go through a game reserve gate, the the community's wallet actually pings, and they and they they actually feel like they're getting benefit from you know that the, the tourism that that takes place. Um, so this project is also well underway and and getting to be quite exciting. Shane, I don't know if you want to add anything there. I love the notion of you know. The community's wallet ping. So if you think about that practically, um, if the attraction to come to the to the lodges is driven because of the inclusion of the community, and if the community are offering the game reserve a fence as a service, and every egg that gets consumed is provided by the local community, and the firewood and um, the cleaning services. Literally, every dollar that gets spent in and around those lodges, a portion of that, that the dividend, and both the services as well as the dividend flows to the community. Um, yeah. and, and it's really that simple. Um, it's very, very doable. And with modern technologies now, tokenization, distributed ledgers, you, you truly have the ability to create these shared ledgers that enables that, that capability. And that to me is the really exciting thing, the transparency yeah. of it, the measurement of it, the optimization of it. Yeah, and, and Medique is just a, well, it's, it's a, it stands on its own, but it's also a proof of concept for a bigger project called Kukula, which we're not gonna cover today. Um, you know, so, so in all of this, we've, we've built out an ecosystem of partners that are participating in really driving and helping us make this make this real and it's really exciting that you know the the, the movement is expanding through um, entities like Cobra and Sation where there's another project um, in the um, pharmaceutical industry which I won't go into the details of at this point um, but the point is that if we collaborate as a collective and create a movement and drive change for impact, 
we, we really think we can do ecosystem transformation at scale. Yeah, and I think so, I'd, I'd like yeah. to um, also share, we've, we've had tremendous conversations with um, Schindler Innovation and Virtual Nation Builder. Um, so in, in that entity, you have um, seasoned legal people who have applied themselves over the last few years into how do we make sure that this, the, the tokens and the tokenization and the minting and, and issuing of NFTs and other mechanisms um, are legal and compliant and fall within the jurisdictions and the, and the policies in, in the different countries and, and markets that we're operating. So again, it's not about a lot of what you see in the web three and the metaverse and the kind of crypto worlds uh, globally where sometimes it's quite hard to sit down and go, well, hang on, what's the true value underneath that? Um, through our partnership with BNB, we can bring the real economy to bear with collateral, with the right legislation and, and, and mechanism places through smart contracts to be able to make sure that this is legit, that mm. um, the risks are managed transparent and, and understandable as well. So I just wanted to raise that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a critical part. And I'm just thinking we should add the NFT auditors logo to this, uh, to this ecosystem yeah. view. Yeah. Because essentially, you know, you, you're securitizing the tokens where they represent land or water or any, as, any physical asset. And then, of course, you can, you can do the sexy things like an NFT of an animal, but um, in a game reserve, for example. But the most, the more important thing would be, um, you know, the securitized tokens that represent real value and increasing value as these transformation projects uh, unfold. So exciting times. I think uh, with that, we should wrap up. All good. Yeah. And come and join us. It's, uh, yeah, it's join the movement. The world. Absolutely. The Thank world. you, Shane. Thank you, Greg.